So, how many of you drink wine at least three times a week or more? Okay. So, we are a beer drinking country, unfortunately. So we are here to try and make this country a wine drinking country if we can, right? So, we drink about five times less than the French. Uh, although we drink as a nation more than any other country, per capita we drink roughly five times less than these guys, right? So I'll take you through the story, my personal story, just how the project got started, and then you know, we'll, we'll get through the presentation. So I lived in France from 86 to 90. I made wine for roughly three of those four years as a, as a hobby, got, got the bug, and then um, went on to start other companies, and then in 2012 or 13, decided that I'd try and become a sommelier. So I went back to school, I, spent, I don't know how many of you guys have seen the movie Somme, right? You know those crazy guys who desperately try to pass those blind tasting exams? That was me for about a year or so. A uh, lot of spitting, a lot of throwing a lot of wine down the drain, and a lot of trying to identify wines based on you know, taste and technical information by looking and smelling the wine. And halfway through that course, I got frustrated, and I said, this is crazy. Wine is a product that's just too snobby for me. Right? It's a product that's essentially where the snobs are talking to other snobs and leaving the other 95% out of it. So Kuwait was born out, of my frustration, born out of my frustration of failing to pass that Somali exam and sort of taking on the project to try and democratize wine. Okay? So this is, the problem with wine today is there are really two problems with wine. One is it spoils. And because it spoils, people will not open a nice bottle on a Tuesday night, you'll save it for a Friday night. And the second problem with wine is, it does a really nice job of making a lot of people feel intimidated about exposing their ignorance and learn about wine. It's, it's like a foreign language, and you know, people just feel more comfortable with beer because it's accessible. Wine, you feel classy drinking it, but most people will just settle for a few safety wines because they don't want to expose their ignorance, right? So what did we do? We said, in order to solve these two problems, the first thing you need to do is to build a platform like Nespresso or Keurig is for coffee, for wine, right? The, the primary objective of this platform, like I said earlier, is to democratize wine and make it as convenient as possible rather than the snobby platform that it is today, right? So the first thing we did is we came up with this packaging format uh, these bottles keep wine fresh not for two or three days, but for 30 to 60 days. So people can now have three to four bottles open simultaneously, and each person can drink what they like. So typically, if you ask people during the week who are wine drinkers, in the week, four out of five people want to drink by the glass. There is still one out of five who can finish an entire bottle every evening, but four out of five want to drink wine by the glass. And on weekends, one out of two want to drink wine by the glass, right? For those four out of five who want to drink wine by the glass, turns out that 80% of the couples want to drink different wines but are forced to settle for the same wine, right? So the very basic use case is that couple who's arguing, should we open a red, should we open a white, they can open both from Monday through Friday, and then Saturday and Sunday they can go back to their old habits. At least that's where we got the project started, right? The, the second problem with wine, like I said, is learning about wine, giving you this language to get comfortable and more confident around wine so you can find better favorites than the few you've settled down with. And so what we did, did in order to solve that problem was, when you look at how many people rate wine honestly, only 5% of people rate wine honestly. 95% of people either don't rate wine or they rate it dishonestly. But if you passively just watch their consumption, when they drink, how much they drink, what varietal they drink, which wine they drink, you can tell, do they drink wine with meals? Because it's six o'clock when they're drinking, or at 10 o'clock, right? You can tell whether they're value drinkers, or brand drinkers, or adventurous in their drinking because they're drinking the same thing or different things, right? If you think about Nielsen, for example, Nielsen has uh, roughly 100,000 human sensors who work for Nielsen, who check out everything they buy and check out, gets uploaded 
for, for groceries gets uploaded to a central database that runs roughly a $100 million business for Nielsen, right? Think of Kuwait if it's collecting data for roughly 10,000 endpoints, it'll create the equivalent database for wine that exists for food today, right? So the big data element of Kuwait is essentially to profile the customer so that we can make better recommendations and guide them to their favorites. I'm just gonna play this. That wine bottle keeps it good. How we went about building these, uh, these special bottles that never let wine spoil, right? So the, this was the challenge. When we started the project, we said, we want to build a bottle that's passive, which means it does not require any inert gas, that keeps the wine fresh, and can be filled in a traditional bottling line. If we do this, we can create essentially the Tetra Pak for wine. So there was some point when Tetra Pak became more popular than glass milk bottles. Some point, cans became more popular than beer bottles. We're hoping to do the same thing for wine, right? And so, if you look at the popular packaging formats today, you have bag in the box. Kuwait is bag in a bottle. So it's the same architecture as bag in the box, except that there's a bag in a bottle. So as you pour the wine, that bag is collapsing on the wine. So no displaced wine is being replaced with oxygen and it's keeping it fresh for, for 30 to 60 days. Now, there were some limitations in bag in the box. It's cheap wine, it's you know, roughly 250 to $9 a bottle. And the reason for that is, when you fill wine in bag in the box, the sulfites are unusually high to protect the wine from oxygen, right? If you can maintain the quality of the wine in this package, just like a glass bottle does by maintaining the sulfites at the same level, because the oxygen ingress at time of filling is the same as a glass bottle, then you can put high quality wine in this package. But you cannot put high quality wine in bag in the box for the simple reason that you know, the sulfites are high and no respectable winemaker is gonna give you wine with high sulfites, right? The other problem with bag in the box is its entire shelf life and drinking life is nine months. And so it does not have any time to go into your pantry or the supply chain. So, this bottle has a exterior shell that acts like aluminum till you crack it open for up to two years. It's got an oxygen barrier added to the plastic shell, so it, does, it protects the pouch inside. After you crack it open, you still get about 30 to 60 days, right? So that ability to provide a long shelf life and a drinking life that lets you drink wine with the same freedom as beer and spirits, you know, was the other innovation compared to bag in the box. It has the same low carbon footprint, roughly half of glass bottles compared to, uh, just like bag in the box. But the, the biggest advantage of a bag in the box is we have roughly 60 wines in the portfolio that range from, like I said, 12 to $75. There isn't a single wine available in the US there's lots of, lots of good back-in-the-box wines available in Australia and Scandinavia, but not in the U.S. That's either imported or that's put in back-in-the-box in the U.S. that touches the quality of wines that you can offer, that we offer in our portfolio at this point, right? So, how many mechanical engineers do we have here? Okay, a few. So, we got started at Bolt. Bolt is an incubator in, in Boston, and the first problem we had to solve is figure out how we would invent the valve that would passively let wine out without letting oxygen in, right? So that valve that you see, this poppet and umbrella valve that you see over here, um, we went through, over a period of the six months we were at Bolt, through about four iterations of valves 
till we came up with the final candidate valve and said, okay, now that we know what we need to do, we can go ahead and make this at scale, right? As you can see, there's this pouch inside this outer shell, right? And the outer shell has an oxygen barrier, like I said, that protects the, any oxygen ingress for up to two years. And after you crack it open and start pouring, then this pouch that is inside still protects the wine for roughly 30 to 60 days, right? And then just like a traditional bottle, it has a screw cap. For the back to collapse, you need the vent because vacuum will let the back collapse. And then we just talked about the valve, right? So what we've done since this project started, it's roughly three years old. The biggest challenge was convincing the wine industry that are really traditional in their approach to wine and don't like to see new packaging and are suspicious of anything but glass that this package can actually shelter wine like a glass bottle does, right? And there are two problems to solve. You have to shelter wine at the time of filling it so oxygen doesn't get into it when you're filling it. And then you have to shelter wine after it's filled for the two years that it's in the supply chain and for the one month that you're drinking it, right? And so what we've done is you take all the varietals that are available from you know, the reds like Cabernet Sauvignon to the whites like Sauvignon Blanc, and you have to test them from a technical perspective. Are the, is the oxygen level and the SO2 level at the appropriate level week after week? And get a group of sommeliers together and do sensory testing where they taste the wine and say, oh, when I opened it, I gave it an 88 point score. And in the case of a red, two weeks later, it tastes like a 90 point wine and then gets back to 88 point wines after a month and a half. In case of whites, it might start off as a 90 point wine like, for example, the Sauvignon Blanc, its aromatics are the most fleeting, and it'll drop in quality from, say, 90 to 88 points for a sommelier, but for the average consumer, it's imperceptible change in quality. We are not arresting oxidation. We are slowing down oxidation to the point that the kind of oxidation that happens in two hours of decanting or two days with a vacu vacuum van, which is this vacuum pump that most people use, that two days is being extended to two months. So what it's doing for you on a Tuesday night, now you can pull that bottle that you're saving for Friday, not one, but two of them with confidence, so each of you can drink, if there are two members in the family, a red and a white that you might enjoy. So the only modification that we made to the filling line was that that particular packaging has a valve in the neck that gets inserted after the wine is filled, and we program an RFID tag on the bottle so that we can identify the wine when you pour it through the dispenser, right? We're doing for time. Wow, we're gonna move fast. So the problems that we wanted to solve on the consumer side, on the data side, if you look at how the bottle is constructed, it has to let you pour the wine, it has to let you quickly switch between wines, it has to let you identify the wine, it has to let you identify who's pouring the wine, depending on the style of pouring. It says, you know, I'm pouring or someone else is pouring, so the accelerometer has a pouring signature, and then make recommendations based on the preferences of that person, right? And so the new rituals that become possible with Kuwait are, once you can open four bottles with confidence because wine doesn't spoil, you're not going to open one. Now you have freedom between you know, you'll open a red and a white on a Monday. Before you know it, on Wednesday, you open two other wines. You enter the weekend with four wines on hand, all of which you like. You're not going to pull a cork on Friday. Our customers are roughly, we have about 1,200 units that have been shipped, are roughly consuming three to four cases a year, which is roughly $750 to $1,000 of spend a year. And, you know, at full scale, our margins are about 50%, right? So much like Keurig, where, you know, people drink a cup of coffee a day, and the, the, the top line is about $1.20 and the bottom line is 50 cents, our consumers spend about 3 to $4 a day, and the top line is $3 and the bottom line is about $1.50 per consumer, right? So the other thing that we try to do is, as we are learning about people's preferences by monitoring the consumption, we're sending recommendations right on the device because it's a connected device, and they can make, make purchases right off the device. So 
just in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is just a very quick demo and just go into Q&A, because I think it's better for you guys to see the product than we finish out the presentation over here. And if you need a volunteer, I'm happy to just tell me. story of the wine is right here. Um, sorry. Um, you can go ahead and pour this. And when you, sw when you switch over to a white, Should try these. These have been open for 45 days. <laughs> Take it to the table. Continue to drink. Maybe give the red to someone else. <laughs> so I'll open up for questions at this point because there's roughly three minutes left, but you can go ahead and ask any questions you want on the mechanical side, on the bottle construction side for the dispenser. So two quick questions. One, uh, what do you do with the bottles after they're completed? And the other question is, is what prevents somebody from reusing the bottle? The, the bottle has a valve that's not removable, so it's not reusable. You just throw it into the recycling stream. It's a number one marked object. It's 50 grams compared to glass being 500 grams. It's roughly 10% of the landfill on the back end. So, uh, oh, ooh, okay, guys, all right. Um, so how did you go, like, can you tell me a little bit about like the early days of marketing? How did you go like take this to market? Because I can imagine there's a lot of ingrained behaviors around like the culture of wine drinking. So that must have been a very difficult thing to overcome. So yeah, so we built the product in 2014 and took it to wineries. They took a full year to test it. Like Coppola, Vintage Wine Estates, and Bonnie Doon have roughly six to eight winemakers between those three wineries and they put their own wine. You know your children well. These wineries know their wines well. They're very sensitive to any change in their wines. For them to be convinced that this package is doing everything we claimed it would, they were not going to put their brands on some new package like this till they were completely convinced, right? So that's the first thing we did. Once they were convinced, we walked down the road in two months and collected another 20 wineries. It was very easy to collect other wineries once they gave us wine, right? Coppola is considered actually the gold standard for trying out new packaging, right? Then we put out 400 hand-built units for home use testing, right? Because we wanted to prove to ourselves that this is a habit-forming, sticky, addictive product, right? Where people will drink a lot more than they said they would drink if they didn't have the guilt or the risk of, putting, of pulling the cork, right? Pardon? 200. 200. 200. So we put out 200 because if you think about it, in when you launch an appliance in a razor blade business, you want to prove statistically that you can take the data and scale the business, right? 
202 geographies, 100 in each geography, is adequate information if you keep distance between the people who are trying it and yourself, means no friends and friends of friends, that you're getting a real read on, on consumption. We learned two things. When users pull four, open four wines, they rarely pull a cork. And the only thing that they wanted from us was a bigger wine portfolio. Great, so I think that's, okay. One last question, let's keep it reasonably quick. Hi, how you doing? Uh, I think you got a great, you have some really innovative ideas with the RFID too. But what's the difference between this and that few dollar air top you can get and pump the air out of? That gives you two to three days of life. This gives you two to three months of life, right? So most people don't have a sophisticated enough palate to know when wine is even spoiled four days in. But on the fifth day, almost anyone knows it's become vinegar, right? If you have a system that doesn't spoil for 30 to 60 days, your entire interaction with wine is like with beer and spirits. You never think about spoilage anymore. You never think, if it's, is it Tuesday or is it Friday? That's the big difference. All right, on this note, thank you very much. It's terrific.